So do I believe that marketing will become more and more oriented towards ways of being able to essentially draw customers in, make them more engaged, more interested? Yeah, absolutely. Do customers trust um, brands to be 100% uh, truthful in terms of what their benefits of their products are? No. Welcome to another episode of ET Brand Equity Digi Plus Dialogue Season 1. Today, we have with us Mr. Scott Minter, Assistant Vice President Marketing of Cars24 Thailand. Before joining the online news card marketplace giant, he was Head of Marketing Operations and Analytics at Central Group. We will take a deep dive into the nuances of performance marketing. But before that, Scott, I, I want a reaction from you on this particular picture. I was, I was researching for this interview and I found this published somewhere. I really want to understand, is this, is this what explains the tectonic shift that we have seen in e-commerce industry? You know, when I look at e-commerce in general, and, and, and I'll, I'll blend that into this picture in a second. So e-commerce has, uh, you know, based on technology, has been having a, a gradual and increasing trend, you know, uh, throughout the last, let's say, 10 years or so, a bit more than that, of course, right? So um, that, of course, had a big jump whenever we moved into COVID. And then now it's reverting back to the original trends as it was before in pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at this picture, more what it reminds me of uh, is actually the physical nature of e-commerce and what makes e-commerce uh, successful. So when we, when we look at e-commerce and think about e-commerce, most people are thinking about the websites, they're thinking about the apps, they're thinking about that shopping journey. But actually what really makes companies successful in e-commerce is the integration of what happens on the online side plus the offline side. And that's something where I think this is also where we can have a bit more of a shameless plug <laughs> for my employer, uh, Cars24. Uh, but, but essentially, you know, this is something where, where when Cars24 is doing something, right, we, we have this obsession for customers, of course, right, as most companies will say that they do. But in, in an industry like used cars, having that obsession with customers really becomes incredibly important. And it's that integration of what happens, let's say, for example, in procuring the right cars, right, or refurbishing those cars. And even capturing, let's say, the images and the flaws of those cars to make sure right. that those are actually really available on the website so customers can build trust that they're actually going to purchase what it is that they think that they're going to purchase, right? And then executing on there. And, and for us in Thailand, uh, when we do our sales, our sales don't happen purely online. So we actually mm -hmm. build leads online. And then that then transitions over to a sales team, which then continues to assist the customer uh, on that journey to the purchase. So right. when I look at that picture, you know, it really shows more about where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, I guess a slight pun intended. Um, <laughs> and, and really how that combination of what happens on the offline side um, and the way that you deal with things there really interacts with the online side to be able to essentially you know, get customers what it is that they're looking for in a way that they want to be able to um, uh, purchase as well too. Mm -hmm. And, and when, I, when I show that picture on digital media, and, and you clearly see a car 24 branded uh, you know, trailer driving the car to, it, to the doorstep of the customer, it's, it's, it's also a big part of your marketing today, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Everything that happens in my mind that really makes e-commerce successful, um, there's a few exceptions, you know, Amazon and things like that. But for the most part, the areas that make most modern companies successful in e-commerce is actually a lot of what happens on the offline side as well, too. So offline advertising becomes very powerful in terms of getting people to be able to understand, hey, that this company exists, right? Gets them into the discovery process and start investigating it, right? So mm -hmm. definitely whatever happens in terms of store locations, for example, where your locations uh, for your stores are going to be, right? How you essentially put your logos on the things that happen in the physical world really then create that positive feedback loop to be able to bring that back into the e-commerce side, again, transacting there and then moving back to the offline side again. Correct. You know, you were head of uh, performance marketing and analytics at Central Group, and now you've switched, switched to Cast24. Do you address performance marketing differently from how you used to treat it at your previous company, Central Group? Yeah, the, the, the two are so different. It, it's, almost like, um, it's almost like a completely different beast. Um, right. and, and understanding the differences in terms of, of how sales work really becomes important. So let's take a look at a place like Central Group. So for that, we'd be running performance marketing for six plus uh, business units, um, which means that we're dealing with a significant number of promotions that we have to be able to put online, right? So uh, my team there was, was building about campaigns for around 2,000 promotions a month, 
right? And those mm-hmm. promotions would have a huge variety in terms of what happens, right? So you have different products, right? You'd have different types of campaigns. So you might have a monthly campaign, weekly campaign, uh, flash deal campaign, you know, four hour campaign, right? Those could have different types of mechanics across them, whether it be a peer discount, a discount with, with a coupon code or interaction with loyalty points, for example, right? So to be able to process that and be able to get that into a set of creative, right? That customers can understand what the benefits of the promotions are is cre- creates a huge amount of loading process, right? On top of that, um, uh, machine learning doesn't work that well in this environment, right? Because machine learning is going to do very good in terms of understanding what's happened in the historical perspective, right? But whenever we know that we have this great promotion going on and we have a huge volume of sales that happens on one day or even a four-hour day, the Mm -hmm. machine learning goes for a toss, right? So at that point in time, we need to be able to leverage human interaction to be able to really get those campaigns to work, to be able to elevate them up and then bring them back down again. At a place like Cars24, we don't have that type of promotion, right? Where things are changing all the time. There's not the interaction with different brands that are happening all the time, right? So right. what that means is that we're much more reliant, essentially, on the machine learning processes of the platforms that we're working on, right? What that means is, is that we have to be a lot more measured in terms of the types of changes that we make on those campaigns, right? So let's say, for example, if we want to be able to increase budget because we have some kind of uh, business condition that we want to increase that for, that may take a week, that may take 10 days, 14 days for us to be able to bring the budgets up on those campaigns to that level and then be able to get them running at that steady state level. While in the process of this increase, where things are still performing at you know relatively optimal um, um, speed as well too, optimal um, you know let's say CPA or ROI as well too, right? So the way that you manage the campaigns, the way that you look at the data, the way that things are analyzing, the way that you coordinate the channels are very very different when it comes to something like e-commerce uh, versus uh, e-commerce in terms of more product versus something like e-commerce when it comes to uh, the used car industry. Correct, correct. Very well explained the differences of the two. Uh, you know, while the role remains the same, the shift in the organization can actually make a big difference. Uh, you know, what according to you are the modern nuances of, of measuring omnichannel return? You mentioned omnichannel. Looking essentially at, you know, what we're looking at is ROI, right? So what is driving yeah. revenue and what are we driving profitable revenue, right? So the, this becomes uh, an incredibly difficult, right? Especially with the variety of channels that are going on, right? Again, online, offline. Typically in e-commerce, most companies are going to be based on something called last click attribution. I think Mm -hmm. most people probably know that, but just to kind of, uh, you know, just to kind of get into that, it means essentially if somebody came in through, let's say, a social ad, then clicked on a search ad and then went to a remarketing ad, the the remarketing ad will get 100 percent of the ad credit. And so from an activity basis in terms of adding budgeting, we'd say, hey, add more budget into that channel because that's what's working really well. Okay. But we all know that essentially the other channels previous to that played a huge part in terms of introducing that customer, you know, to the e-commerce platform and to the eventual sale as well, too. So taking a look at that, you know, looking at that last click attribution, then we now need to start bringing that back a bit more. And there's other types of attribution where we can look at. For example, there's multi-touch attribution, which mm-hmm. could be rule-based or could be machine learning based on something like you know, Markov chains or shapely models, which, which take into account different uh, types of information. You can take a look at incrementality studies where you may say, hey, you know, run our normal channels, but maybe take uh, out some channels, for example, in certain geographies and compare that against the channels we did not take that out with and see if we act- if those channels are actually adding incremental value. Uh, the other one can be, for example, uh, media mix modeling, MMM, where we're taking a series of data, typically cost information or impression information, and we're now looking at that data over a period of time and matching that against the revenue that's generated. And then being able to use machine learning to be able to say, hey, which of these channels are really having the most impact of that, right? Correct. Um, So, you know, determining the right method uh, for the attribution is very important for companies to be able to learn that. And and there's different nuances that each of these different types of attribution uh, takes into account and certain that they don't. So no matter what happens, whether it's an automated rule or, or machine learning based, there still needs to be a large amount of essentially people interaction in that mm-hmm. to be able to help make a better decision in terms of what the machine learning is telling you or what the other rule base could be telling you. So that way you can continuously say, hey, based on these activities, how do we continuously you know, increase our ROI, increase our volumes? 
Correct. And now, based on your experience and, and the market research data that is available, how will you analyze or how will you rate uh, you know, the, the, the marketing channels which are probably most efficient for, for performance marketing? So what I mean to ask is, in, what according to you are the most efficient performance marketing channels today and, and, and why? Okay, I think there's some caveats to that. Um, yeah. But um, let, let's just let's just take the, the, the question just at that value. So I think we can take a look at three different types of channels um, that that work when it comes to e-commerce, right? Uh, first channel, and I think the OG uh, of channels, which is going to be Google search, right? Yeah. Um, so that's really going to be the key area that we're able to build into. And companies are able to have customers that actually use search for their products. So let's say, for example, if we look at e-commerce, something like sneakers, electronics, this is going to be heavily search oriented. But let's mm -hmm. say, for example, grocery, for example, or fashion, uh, minus shoes, um, will we'll be very very heavy will be very light in terms of the searching on search, right? But for those companies where essentially search becomes a heavy part of that decision making process, then building the campaign structure and be able to essentially uh, uh, build in nuances in there makes search very, very powerful, right? So that would be the OG. And that's where most companies are going to start with, right? Uh, moving on from there, the next one isn't so much of a channel, but more of a way of marketing, which I would look at as app installs, right? Yeah, so uh, okay. doing app installs. And so that's going to be something that's going to cut across, you know, social platforms, uh, non-social platforms, right? So essentially getting those app installs. And that becomes, especially now in 2022 and beyond, becomes very repeatable, right? So we can do these app installs and still get pretty good last click attribution, essentially, on those app installs, right? For those companies that are able to have apps that work, right? Um, uh, but not only are we able to essentially build the ROI from that very first interaction there, we also know that we're doing is we're also installing that app on the phone, which can then be used for future purchases in the future. Or even on that current purchase, let's say, for example, for Cars24, we're going to see significant conversion rates, um, benefits that happen from customers browsing on the app versus browsing on our websites or mobile sites. Right. So right. that becomes another very powerful um, performance marketing channel to work with. And then the last one essentially is a bit more difficult to scale. Um, and again, it's going to be more of a conglomerate of things, but there's going to be essentially affiliate marketing, right? Yeah. So affiliate marketing, we might be getting into price comparison sites. We might be getting into cashback sites. There might be different content marketing sites that we're working with, right? Um, for that, in general, uh, affiliate marketing tends to work very well at a very specific uh, cost per action. So normally we can say, hey, we're going to pay you and compensate you based upon this action. And then that becomes very repeatable from there, right? The, the, only, the only major issue with, uh, with, app, with, or sorry, with affiliate marketing is that it tends to be difficult to really scale it controllably, right? So you're essentially going to invest as much as you can in there. Um, there's some things that you have to take care of when it comes to ad fraud and things like that in there. But um, you're going to try to scale as much as possible uh, there. But then you're only going to be able to achieve so much of your budget on there. And again, then you're going to go back and spend on your other performance channels. Great. Great. What a brilliant way to summarize it. My next question to you, Scott, is uh, whenever we interact with CMOs, there are two common perceptions. You know, one is data is important. In fact, very important, they say. However, there is this concern. As they say, what is even more important today is simplification of the data that are available with them. Uh, do you think automation is addressing this issue of, of making data, simplifying data and making them presenting things to you uh, you know, as, as actionable insights. So the experts at automation um, are not going to be the subject matter experts on what simplifies insights, right? So from my perspective, automation itself will just give you more of what it is that you've designed it to do, right? And so that's where it really becomes that partnership between the business owners and let's say the data engineers and the BI teams really be able to come together to be able to understand what those actionable insights are, right? So mm -hmm. data by itself is just simply confusing, right? Uh, disseminating that down into, into real insight really takes a significant amount of essentially subject matter expertise, right? So automation by itself. No, I'm a huge fan of automation. I've been trying to automate everything I possibly can um, ever since I've been in digital marketing because there's a lot of manual work um, that happens in digital marketing. Um, so that automation enables the teams to be able to respond faster, do things faster. 
Uh, and at the same time, without having the right people and the stakeholders involved and being able to blend those teams together, automation, again, will just give you more of what you've had before. So it really uh, is important for CMOs um, and for everybody to make sure that those business owners have really strong relationships with the BI teams, with the data engineering teams, that they're able to really put through and say, hey, this is the type of data that we need, the way that we need to be able to see that, that enables them to move from uh, even from a dashboard into some very specific, let's say, segment insights um, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. How are you engaging with, with customers or other potential customers uh, you know, with content on social media? And can you, can you now target, convert, uh, you know, on, on social media? I mean, that, that identifying, you know, conversing, targeting, and then eventually converting as a customer. Can that entire cycle happen on social media? Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to break social media up into, I don't there's nothing innovative here, but into two areas, right? One is paid marketing and one is more the organic marketing, right? right? So the paid marketing, for sure. I've been running paid um, social marketing since 2013 um, at, at, at the ROIs required to be able to make things profitable. So definitely it's 100% profitable to be able to do that on the paid side and be able to leverage that. Um, when it comes to the organic side, sometimes that's a bit more tricky, right? You know, really getting the ROI out of that. And that's where essentially the content and developing those true content pillars becomes really, really important. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Cars24, we try to say that we're a one-stop expert service. Uh, so what that means is by taking that and be able to springboard off of that into the content, it means what kind of content are we creating, right? So we will be able to create video content, for example, which essentially shows our salespeople or our marketing people essentially um, displaying cars, going through the benefits of those cars, what's happening with those cars, why are those cars specifically interesting, right? Um, right. What we found from those videos actually is that customers are watching those videos and contacting us and sometimes requesting that specific car or that specific salesperson to be able to talk uh, to, to be able to essentially, you know, continue their, their journey in terms of that, that car purchase. So definitely social overall gives us that ability to be able to do lots of different things. And that also is what becomes really, really important um, with it, which is there's so many things that you can do on social, right? Making sure that you come up with the right paid plan, making sure that you come up with the right um, content and organic plan becomes really critical so you don't lose your path on that process. Great. And, and, and as we talk about social media, you know, there's a lot of conversation that e-commerce is now moving to social commerce, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not just about meta anymore. You have the WeChat, TikTok, or you know, global platforms, all are becoming as important as, uh, you know, being, being present on the highway billboard that we just saw. So do you, do you agree to that? Like, is that, is that how we are moving ahead? I think it also depends a bit in terms of how you, um, how you, what you call as social commerce. So let's say, for example, you know, star ratings on pro on products, right? Reviews of products is that social commerce, for example, right? Um, mm -hmm. I would argue that that is social commerce, right? Which still can happen essentially on an e-commerce platform. So, um, do I believe that marketing will become more and more oriented towards ways of being able to essentially draw customers in, make them more engaged, more interested? Yeah, absolutely. Do customers trust um, brands to be 100% uh, truthful in terms of what their benefits of their products are? No. And, and so customers are always going to look for word of mouth from other customers to be able to get something in there. But but in general, when, when we take a look at some of the key pillars, essentially, of social commerce, a lot of that ends up being video, right? So right. trying to engage on video. We're also seeing that it may not be the media platform itself. It might be the e-commerce platform, which actually has that, um, that, has that video on there. So here in our region, so there's, um, I do a lot of my shopping on uh, an app called Lazada. Um, so there they actually have, within the platform, they'll have videos running on that platform where customers can engage and then contact uh, the sellers directly on there. So I do think that social commerce is definitely a way forward. I don't think it's the right thing for every single business. Um, there will become a time where every aspect of what you're selling that will have some social aspect though. Great, absolutely great. You know, we move into our next segment. This is called the rapid fire or the topic time segment. Uh, here you are thrown some questions and you are asked to answer them immediately as short as possible. So, you know, are we are we a little too impatient in analyzing ROI when it comes to digital marketing? Yes. Great. <laughs> it, 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 you, you want to put a line to it? Yeah, yeah. So you said sure as possible, but um, yeah, so... I, th I think all marketing activities, especially as we move towards this era where people uh, expect immediate uh, demands, 
I think people are just expecting, hey, I throw an ad out there, I should be able to get revenue generated from that. So uh, again, from my perspective, if you're looking at something like search or you're looking at something like remarketing, yes, I expect very fast returns off of a platform like that. But if we start moving into something more like a YouTube, for example, right, then then look, you know, running, you know, a two, three day campaign on YouTube and expecting that that's going to send product off the shelves, you know, I, I think is a bit ambitious. Great. A trend that has excited you the most in 2022? Um, actually, for me, what's really interesting ends up being retail media. Um, so I think for me, retail media becomes that interesting part where now we're getting platforms which were not used as advertising platforms, which are now increasingly being used that way. And one of the reasons it becomes exciting is because it starts breaking down some of the walled gardens that are happening. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, we're creating more walled gardens, essentially, but it does diversify the ability to be able to put budget across different types of walled gardens to be able to relieve the pressure on each of those and be able to essentially bring down essentially our cost per acquisitions and be able to increase our, our ROI on that. So I do think that re that's essentially retail media um, has a huge amount of potential, especially because when we're talking about sales, the places which really will know the best about what customers' interests are, essentially those platforms which are actually selling those products. Great. One most challenging aspect of social media, according to you? I think it's that combination of, <laughs> of creativity mm -hmm. with measurement. Right. So okay. there's a huge amount of things that you can do which are very creative. Mm -hmm. um, measuring the success of that becomes incredibly difficult, right? Like we were discussing a bit before about last click attribution and where the role of discovery is on that. You know, you can do some really innovative things on social, which may be able to get customers to uh, discover more of you. But then getting that attributed back to those areas of creativity is, is, is a huge challenge. What is your view on Gartner's report claiming that marketers like you will abandon personalization by 2025? I just, I just can't imagine. Um, I mean, every marketer's goal is to have that one-to-one -one conversation with customers. So do I think that marketers will have to reshape their expectations of what personalization means? Absolutely, mm -hmm. right? Personalization is mainly going to be built on machine learning, right? Uh, uh, machine learning is, is obviously going to be limited uh, in terms of what it does, in terms of understanding that person based on the volume of interactions you might have with those people. So I think that uh, just saying, hey, we want to have one-to-one -one personalization with everybody. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I don't believe that should be the goal. But saying that we want to essentially engage customers and maximize the potential of personalization that it has on the, on the journey, I think that that's something that uh, marketers will continue to strive for moving into 2025 and beyond that as well. Great. In a first party data, do you think it will be the differentiator and it will provide you the competitive advantage? No, or are we, are we a little uh, too, too, going too gaga over, over the first party data? I think we can just even look. So let's take a look at the data that Google has and the data Facebook has, right? They were yeah. able to essentially build their platforms off of their own first party data, right? We don't consider that first party data. You know, usually we're looking at our own data. But if you take a look at that, first party data is essentially, again, you know, data is the oil, first party data is the oil, really is the oil that gets machinery. That's where you're going to get your insights from. And even if we start going back and saying, hey, you know, retail media, uh, you know, retail media will then enable different revenue streams, right, by having that first party data that enables you to essentially get uh, more uh, resources that are able to uh, uh, enable you to essentially get on top of your competition as well. So first party data is definitely critical. Um, bothering your, your customers too much to get that first party data. I think there is a big balance that that needs to happen, that we shouldn't be trying to measure every uh, small interaction that a customer has. So I think we need to balance what first party data that we're getting and the importance of that first party data. But overall, just as a broad general concept, first party data is definitely a key to winning. Yeah. Great. You know, as, as more marketing dollars are shifted toward performance, then branding, uh, mm. do you think television is losing ad dollars in Asia to digital advertising? So I think that there's going to be every time that there's a new media that gets um, uh, put in place, right, there's always going to have to be some kind of advertising that supports that, right? So starting from, uh, you know, pictures on walls, right, moving into radio, moving into television, 
you know, a- as consumer attention gets divided, right, essentially there's going to be advertising that's going to be happening on those platforms. And of course, we need to be able to shift budgets across that. And it also um, just kind of before just kind of dispersing while, while we don't want to be too fragmented, having a great um, a media strategy that enables you to essentially put your spends across multiple platforms to engage with them in the appropriate way is really what's going to maximize your ROI. So uh, television, uh, I don't believe I mean, you know, unless we say sporting events, unless we say live events, unless we say you know, new shows coming out where people want to be the first to watch that show, for example, unless all those things go away, even something like linear television isn't necessarily going to go fully away as well, too. Right. So um, uh, is there a shift to be able to put budgets on digital? Yeah. But but I think that this is just a natural progression that happens across media over time as new things uh, come about. Great. Great. That was our stoppage time segment. You are fantastic, Scott. Thank you very much. Uh, we have just two more questions before we let you let you go. Uh, when you look at the market, you know, market dynamics today, what are the two warning signs that you spot when it comes to driving performance marketing? I think right now the key challenge that, and it's a great challenge to have, um, is, mm-hmm. of course, the privacy challenge, right? So essentially, you know, as performance marketing has gotten too intrusive, right, as the tracking has gotten too intrusive, now people are becoming more and more aware, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. of some of the issues that what looks very innocuous, hey, they're just trying to show me an ad. But, you know, what the impact of that can actually have, uh, you know, essentially upon people's views and things like that, right? So uh, for me, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, understanding the privacy challenge, uh, embracing the privacy challenge, because, you know, it definitely makes my job more difficult as these privacy laws come in place. But, you know, I'm, I'm a person and I, and I respect my own privacy. I, I'm very interested mm-hmm. in that. So embracing that challenge and being able to work within the constraints there to be able to still advertise to customers, uh, get them interested, right? I think this is the, this is going to be a big thing as we move forward um, uh, for the next few years. That would be number one. And, and maybe just kind of on that is also just making sure that companies that are also saying, hey, we're doing these for privacy reasons. Sometimes are they actually getting that for privacy reasons or are they actually doing that to be able to essentially build higher and higher, you know, uh, walls around their garden as well, too. So I think just just kind of enabling, just understanding how the privacy is enabling or disable, you know, disenabling uh, different people and companies, I think, becomes really important um, over the next few years. Great. Great. Last question. And this is, I mean, for, for all the young marketers there trying to drive performance, leveraging digital, what are your what are your two bits for them that you will leave it? The first thing I think is that there is no shortcuts, right? So what do I mean by that? To really understand digital marketing, if you really want to get into it, you have to understand the platforms, right? You have to understand, go in deep into the platforms, understand the nuances of the platforms, right? Uh, just taking a simple uh, test and saying, hey, I'm now, you know, have this certified, whatever on that, it isn't really enough. And, and that actually won't get you where you want to go, right? Really getting the hands-on time on the platforms, launching campaigns, right? Doing all those things hands-on to really understand all those really in-depth nuances in terms of how you can target, what you can target, what you can do, right? That, that seems very tactical, but all those tactical things you can then leverage later on in your career to really build a lot more strategy in terms of how the platforms are going to work and how those platforms are going to combine with all the different channels that will be running as well at the same time. Um, so I think that'd be number one. Uh, number two really comes down into, um, you know, know your math, right? <laughs> right? Analytics becomes incredibly important, right? Uh, you know, being able to make sure that you can use Excel, make sure you know what every single right click function is on Excel. Be able to make sure that you can actually do the math in your head. So as you're doing having conversations with people, right, you're in the game in terms of those conversations, understanding what's going on. You know, these are two areas, you know, understanding the platforms, understanding the math behind the platforms, I think are really two crucial areas for young marketers to really be able to build their careers um, in something like performance marketing and to move that into other types of marketing as well. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. You were fantastic. And it was an honor to have you today on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. All right, cheers.